good. Welcome, everybody, to today's stand-up and office hours for Tuesday, May 30th, 2023 okay. at Open Research Institute. It's great to have you here. So have a short presentation, uh, and then we'll uh, we'll open it up for, for office hours. Uh, plenty to talk about. Okay, so a lot of what we do is oriented towards amateur radio use or is, or uses amateur radio bands in order to prove out a design. And I think it's a good idea to, to go over, um, you know, like, um, what we, what we do this for, uh, you know, and why it's a uh, part 97 is the federal regulations that govern the amateur radio services. And there's five justifications for it. And, these are emergency communications, international goodwill to increase the technical core in the United States to advance the radio arts and for public service. And each of these has a, a knockdown effect that we know if we're sort of in the culture of amateur radio. But if we're not and and we're we're using sort of amateur radio. Oh, thank you. Somebody says I'm showing a home screen and not slides. So I'll start over. picked it and it didn't work. All right, let's see. How about this? Much better. Oh, good. Okay. Always good to know. It looks the same to me, but uh, it wasn't. I have an issue with your first slide. With, with this one? No. <laughs> yes. Yes. Go tell us. Tell us the issue. It, it, what's bugged me for years is and you're not showing it, what does Part 97 say the amateur radio service is? It doesn't, and that is... Oh, it been... does. It does. Well, it says the justifications, but it, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't say it enough. There's been a lot of other peripheral conversations and no, resolutions and stuff about it, and, and there's stuff going on right now in it's, it's a number... It's been a disaster for him yes. radio. It kind of has. It it's been... Says. Uh, go instance, ahead. It has prevented amateur satellite service from launching uh, science missions. Yeah, there is some interference there for sure. Yeah, part 97 should say what you, the rest of your slide says, and it doesn't. Yeah, the justifications are not really enough. They're in, in, and a lot of, um, in, in conversations with people that have been around the block and, and know about regulatory law, the, the set of justifications that set out why we do this and why the amateur radio services are special. Um, there's been times where these justifications have been targeted for deletion, that they're not necessary for defining what we do or, or kind of giving context for the privileges. Because anytime that you have something that's non-commercial, it needs to really be defended and 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 you know you have to put some put your back into it you have to explicitly say why it's valuable and we see this in uh military federal uh scientific um we see this in other services as well where for example the fact that we have a quiet place for uh astro you know this astronomy for radio astronomy is only because of of a tremendous amount of effort um the fact that we have frequencies set aside for for military and defense is because of a lot of focused effort and and bringing it all the way up to the highest level of government over and over again the military has an advantage over us in that there's a, a specific sort of uh, need for national defense the military is extremely well funded in the united states getting roughly half of our budget and we're a, a relatively decentralized group of people that are trying to do something that is uh, altruistic and delayed gratification, really. So here we are with our service, with all of the things that you've said, which are accurate. It's it's tricky. It needs to be defended. Not really enough of us doing it. And these are the reasons that we do it. So these reasons... Uh, a lot of this is why Open Research Institute exists and, and why we're organized the way that we are and why we're picking the sorts of R&D subjects that we that we pick rather than just gravitating to whatever we can make money off of. 
um, we're all volunteers and volunteering our time to kind of advance the radio arts, to increase the technical core for initial goodwill. We care about emergency communications. We have at least one or two projects in that realm. And, and really it's all about public service. These things are, I think they're, are demonstrably good. And we have one or two, if you want to, you know, because the amateur radio service and the amateur satellite service are distinct. We have two radio services in the United States where you get to do this sort of stuff and not a whole lot of uh, advocacy, really, um, compared to the good that it that it gives us. So that's one of the things that I, I just wanted to remind us of what we're here for and why we do the things uh, that we do. So there's a lot of untapped designs out there. The slide just kind of uh, touches on three things that we've been been looking at recently um, that that are that are out there that were not commercially valued in some way, um, and that we're we're trying to to kind of uh, revive or to pay attention to um, the G2QM. This is the essentially the dumbbell antenna. This is the HF antenna that is a very compact design, which has some some really good performance things. The original article about this is from 1958 in the RSGB uh, journal. So this is an amateur radio newsletter. So it's a, a old article. Um, it got revived a couple of times uh, in the 70s, in the 80s, and then a little more recently. Then uh, Paul, actually, uh, he's here on the call. He ran across a project um, archive about a TMS 32010 DSP uh, project uh, that was a collaboration between AMSAT and Tapper where they reverse engineered a design. This is from 1988. Um, and a, a bunch of remarkable stuff that, that according to, to Paul, uh, not yet really followed up on all of this. There's uh, it, some, it, some interesting things about this this uh, a body of work. And it's unpublished because it was on CompuServe on a private channel. And then in 2008, there was an ARL, a league had an SDR working group, and they declared in 2008 that there was an inexorable march to software radio as the standard for radio and amateur radio circles. So now, <laughs> so we'll skip forward. So now after this article from 1958 about HF antennas, we have a dumbbell project which is essentially a meander dipole. Um, and there's an actual simulated result. We have built some prototypes. The DC crew did this and found out that it worked. Uh, and we'll just march forward on that. Um, in terms of DSP and SDR, GNU radio is widely used in amateur and experimental radio. So we're, we are seeing a lot of what was talked about in, in the 80s start to come about from open source. And in terms of software-defined radio and amateur radio, you can get an RTL SDR and a Raspberry Pi free firmware from GitHub. And for a hundred bucks or so, you've got an extremely powerful SDR receiver that can do almost anything. You can change it um, with a couple of keystrokes. So what's the problem? There's been all of this advancement in, in over the past couple of decades. And from an from, so from an individual perspective, it looks like this rush, this this river of technology rushing by and things are progressing. But from an organizational standpoint, looking out onto the world right now, like us, you know, speaking from the point of view of ORI and lots of other clubs, getting the word out about what you're doing has never been harder. So, I mean, do you like ads as an individual? Are you now ad blind? Do you just ignore them whenever you see them? Because we're drowning in ads, but ads are the only way that, that an organization can get the word out about what it does and to attract new volunteers. We have severe channel fragmentation in that if you're not a big company, your, your Google ad is not going to get anywhere. Um, so I'll just name off some channels that, that we're active on. We post on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, uh, research gate. Um, we, we used to be on Google plus, uh, face, Facebook groups, Facebook page, um, regular, uh, Oh, uh, 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 Mastodon, um, you know, our own webpage, uh, GitHub IO webpage and, uh, and on and on IRC channels, matrix channels, um, discord servers, Slack servers, 
And when you go into Discord and Slack, that's like 12 or 13 different places that we routinely try to spread the word. Does it do any good? We hope so, uh, but it's an enormous amount of effort and all these channels are very fragmented. Uh, and you're fighting against very well-funded automatic algorithms from, from companies when you're trying to spread the word. And then a lot of times open source projects or open source groups like organizations try to do stuff in amateur radio really do make a fundamental mistake of believing the source code or schematic will speak for itself. It doesn't. The design does not speak for itself. You have to explain it over and over again and make it easy to use well beyond what you think might be easy to use. And everybody has limited time. And we've all run into this uh, at ORI. Uh, amateur radio is definitely not immune from some, some isms, uh, lots of censorship and harassment and exclusion and racism and sexism and bigotry. This is out there. And as a, from an organizational perspective, we've had to deal with it. And, you know, we really don't fit in as kind of a, uh, an organization. We're not top down and we're not authoritarian. And our attempts to collaborate with traditional amateur radio organizations that are top down and are authoritarian, uh, not successful. And I'm not really sure what to do about that. Maybe anybody listening to this can suggest some things or we just keep doing what we're doing and move on. So the traditional path to getting involved in technical side of, of the thing that we are most relevant to, which is amateur radio, has been clubs. And the interesting thing about clubs is that clubs and organizations and associations of all types in the United States and all over the world have been in severe decline for four decades. So if you go back to 1835, Alex, Alexis de Tocqueville wrote Democracy in America, and he wrote about how prominent voluntary private associations were in the organization of social, political, and economic affairs in the United States. He's an outsider looking in and was dumbfounded at how amazing and how much stuff was going on. 1835 all the way up to about 1900, this is, this is how shit got done in the United States. And education, entertainment, socializing, and credentials were all handled mainly through voluntary private associations. Government and companies didn't really do a whole lot here. Uh, formal clubs and orgs handled it all. When you hit the age of commercial radio and people started getting entertainment and news at home, and then television, and then the internet, then these functions from voluntary private associations were peeled away one after another after another over many decades. And so now clubs and organizations, which we look to for, at least in, in most hobbies, ranging from you know ro growing roses to amateur radio to Linux groups to whatever, these groups mainly socialize. They allow you socialization opportunities, but the the education and, and and entertainment and the credentials are you're on kind of your own. This has been a big shift in in how we do technical work. You know, if you were interested in steam valves in 1835, the way that you learned about it and got good at it is different, fundamentally different than the way you do it today. Um, somebody that was interested in learning computer science 50 years ago, you know, very different than today. <laughs> In, in how you would you uh, get involved and, and enjoy it. So what we've seen is the rise of ad hoc networks and responsive clubs or responsive organizations. And ad hoc networks are very informal. They're not incorporated and they don't have a corporate shield. And that's a big deal. No dues, no bylaws. They're out there getting things done and you can find them. And there's ways that you can find them in the list them here. But like, what's the weakness of a informal group? And it, boils down to like things like liability, being able to own property, being able to buy stuff, you know, acting as a as a corporation. So we need both of them. And I think what we're trying to do at ORI is to be uh, be to provide those formal functions, but not in a way that is this top down authoritarian way that has turned off so many people, uh, especially in our hobby. And then I listed some some examples here. Like, can an informal ad hoc group that's flexible and responsive and everybody's doing fun things, can they go and lobby Congress like, like the league does? Well, no. It's really, really hard uh, to do that. And can they own property? Not easily. And then can they protect their members from liability? Not easily. So those are the sorts of things that we've chosen to provide here at ORI. And, you know, 
be getting the word out about like, yes, you can take advantage of this stuff, but you don't have to put up with the things that, that may, maybe, uh, were kind of a burden or turned you off or were an impediment. Uh, the getting the word out has been really kind of difficult. So why care about all this stuff? It's because the technical is social before it's technical. And the way that you distribute and talk about tech is part of the technology. It's really not possible to excise the math and the circuit design and to get things done um, outside of maybe you yeah, at your desk. You know, if you want to do all this by yourself, sure, then you can just say, oh, it's just technical. It's it's immune from all these different social changes. But if we want to get things done in groups, then we have to confront it. The way that we do technical work has evolved because everything about clubs and organizations has evolved, especially in the United States. So the good news is that we have, do we have document storage available from almost anywhere at any time. We have cheap gain and cheap computing and cheap PCBs made in days and cheap components for the most part, even though the supply chain stuff has still been kind of a problem. When we look at like contributors to, to projects, there's some interesting things that happen. This graph, if you notice it's logarithmic uh, scale, um, but notice the linear results of the, of the data this is all free and open source software projects. So most amateur radio technical projects um, can fit into this model. So this is not data specifically towards amateur radio, it's towards free and open source software community because there's free and open source software is many times larger than, than open, open source amateur radio. But uh, I argue that there's uh, enough overlap here to where these results actually do apply to us. And so, I'm going to propose this as as a model that that applies to us as well, and you can see that half of all projects have one contributor. So everything out there that's that's you know all this technical work going on in the community, it's about half is done by one person. Twenty percent have two, and so on. And and this is a kind of a beautiful result. It it shows up in a attractive graph. And it sort of cognitively, intuitively makes sense. And you can see that the largest view have like 100 committers to the project. And I think this is this is just out of human psychology. So when we look at our projects at ORI, um, most of them have multiple people, uh, three, four, five, or more. So we really are kind of at the upper end of the scale in terms of complexity and and performance um we do have some some singleton projects at ori but not very many uh some of our some of our projects have quite a few people and then the way that all this work gets done um there's the on the left there's the triangle this is the three things that almost all open source technical work has. There's some sort of document repository, there's some sort of mailing list or a forum, and there's some sort of chat room for instant communications. And those three things are like a three-legged stool, and you can see this over and over again. The way that they're governed can range from a duocracy, where the people that show up are the people that run it, to a founder leader, which is the by far the most common in, in amateur radio technical work. Whoever founds the project, leads the project, you know, organizes the work, and it's an enlightened despot. Then you have a self-appointing council or board, and this is to where you're you're big enough to where you have to have a group of people splitting up the work, and you have to like start naming names. You get into electoral, where you're actually formally electing people to to a you know like a club. This would be a non-incorporated club. You get into corporate backed, where you have to have a board of directors follow some sort of rules. You, you're organized enough to where you have an incorporation and then foundation backed to where it's some sort of outside foundation. And so ORI falls in, falls into the electoral and corporate backed sort of category. Um, we have self, it's, it's people that step up and say, yes, I would like to, to be on your board. And they're accepted by the, the active members of the community. And it's, it's backed by a corporation, uh, by a nonprofit. So here's our current technical lineup. We are a 501c3 nonprofit R&D firm. We directly benefit amateur radio. This is 100% open source designs. We have remotely accessible lab benches, diverse and active board of directors, and multiple sources of funding. 
We have an open source high earth orbit or geosynchronous orbit amateur radio communication satellite. It's a transponder and electric propulsion motors. That's the focus of this project where it's the communication system and the motors. There's a lot of other stuff that goes on the spacecraft. That's where our focus is and making progress, but we've had some enormous setbacks here and some of, some of which have been entirely political, uh, but still steaming ahead. Uh, half of the remote lab West is devoted to the, the transponder project here and good works coming out of it. Ribbit radio is a HF, VHF or UHF uh, tactical emergency communications mode. And it is, you have an app that creates a audio signal that you play over any radio. And this is essentially digital SMS messaging using the most advanced forward air correction that we have, polar codes. And this is moving forward. The big win here is that these apps are open source and they exist on both Android and Apple. It's the first uh, amateur radio application that we know of on either one of these platforms, and they're both open source applications and very useful over this over this summer coming right up. This is going to be um, demonstrated, and and there will be some 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 tests uh, both with uh, emergency communications groups and with the APRS people. So there's a lot of folks looking really hard at it, and. The incorporation of this particular mode into emergency communications would be would be good. Um, you get digital communications without any wires or any extra equipment whatsoever from a free app. The RF Bitbanger is one of our projects. This is a low power HF HF kit radio, and it's designed uh, to be built from your junk box. That's the original idea. the The neat thing about this. It's a classy amplifier, which not a whole lot of people know about, but is a really cool design. Um, it has a, it comes along with a new digital HF mode, which is around about as good as FT8, but allows you to have a QSO. So you can actually talk back and forth. It does not have a rigid structure uh, like FT8. Um, the most recent news on this is that the kit, uh, there may be a variant that's all uh, SM uh, surface mount. Um, so that's kind of exciting. You can you can either get a traditional through hole and junk box style, or with uh, with SMT. Neptune is a point to point digital communications link designed for drones in amateur aerospace. This is lever hard leverage on LTE, which is long term evolution uh, cellular. So it's OFDM. And if you've ever been curious about OFDM then this is a great way to learn. Uh, the specification is, is out for uh, review. So it's a draft. There is lots of stuff that needs to be added to this draft in order to get it up to spec, to make it a spec. Uh, but it's a really good start and it's gotten a lot of people excited. Um, so one of the things that makes this interesting is that this directly addresses the dominance in the market of um, some of the Chinese drone manufacturers and their closed and proprietary source uh, communications protocols. Uh, this will work over five gigahertz amateur bands and it can be used in, like we say, in, in uh, amateur aerospace. So what we're hoping is to prove it out uh, terrestrially and that it will also be useful for, for space and aerospace. This is using the other half of Remote Labs West stations, and it's going to leverage uh, MathWorks HDL coder for, for getting things done. And then Opulent Voice. This is a high fidelity digital voice for 70 centimeters and above. It uses 16 kilobit per second OPS codec and can transmit data or voice without having to switch back and forth. And things are working forward every day as a new adventure with um, challenges and opportunities. This is the native digital uplink uh, for the high flyer or the, the transponder for, for amateur space. Dumbbell antenna is the HF antenna that, that we talked about briefly uh, from the 1958 article um, highlighting how there's tons and tons and tons of really overlooked interesting things out there. Just if you look at amateur radio newsletters alone. So just going through all of the PDFs out there, 
uh, on the internet, you can find all sorts of ideas that weren't explored for various reasons, uh, you know, and, and this one looks like it, it, it uh, has some, some potential. So like the slide says, amateur radios were overlooked techniques and underutilized bands get new lives. This is a variant of the meander dipole. There's several different ways to do this. Uh, and so we're, we've built some, measured some, looks good, going to press forward and see what happens with this and potentially sell them. So what we get a lot is, but I'm not technical enough to contribute. We get a lot of that when we invite people to join or when they show up or when they uh, meet us in person. And what we tell them is that you do not have to be an expert to join. You just have to be willing to become more of one along the way. And we have said that a lot, but we mean it. And it does, this deserves to really be heard. Amateur radio is a way that you can actually just become more of an expert, that you can take off piece of the of any of the things we've talked about and make it happen. And there's a ton of other stuff. So when we do outreach, we really need to emphasize that there's a ton of other things that need to happen in order for an organization like us to succeed. And and it ranges from art uh, all the way up to to social events organizing and everything in between. Key enabling developments for for us to have done all that we've done so far, and the things that we're going to do over the next year, has been internet comms, all these open source licenses, and the open source mindset, cheap computing, and we mean GPUs and FPGAs and ASICs and PCs. And when so when I say cheap computing, some of the stuff actually is still really expensive. Like when we order a dev board, it's thousands of dollars, but it's not tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands. It's just low thousands. We can afford it and make it available to people to use. This is getting within the realm of letting people directly manipulate, you know, the the electromagnetic spectrum with with a gigahertz, you know, power, you know, and and we'll make it as easy as we can. It still requires some seat time and elbow grease, but like we are well within the ability to to allow motivated amateurs as much power as as many companies do and this is really exciting it's just uh like i said it's been hard to get the word out we have cheap gain yeah you can get gain for for relatively cheap there's plentiful microwave parts i put a little dollar sign there because they are still kind of expensive but 5g and 6g have really changed the entire market um microwave parts you can you can get them for tens of dollars not hundreds or thousands uh it's it's you still have to be a little bit picky and and patient, but you know we're we're looking at a a, a big step forward in terms of microwave. There's there's some significant regulatory relief, like we've done some, other people have done some, and we have modern organizational and governance models that really welcome people and let them participate. And then, so what's next? Uh, that's really kind of the question here. Um, we need to get past this weird DT bindings error when building our embedded Linux for Neptune. We need to get Remote Lab South more recognition and activity and FPGA and microbiology customers. We need to build more of the dipole HF antennas to prove out the promise that's seen in our simulations. We need people to build and test the RF bit banger designs and to get to the point where we have a kit. We we get lots and lots of of requests for kits. And I think that, that it could be a success. And there's lots more, and we have a getting started page. Um, and so that's the presentation today. That's where I wanted to kind of start out and, uh, and talk to everybody. Um, and now I'm going to, I'm gonna stop sharing and come back to the screen. Thank you everybody for, for being here. Let's, uh, let's open the floor for any sorts of discussion. or any questions at all. I have a couple that were sent to me um, that I can share from pe people that weren't able to be here today. Um, so there's there's a, a request for a digital spark gap project. This is a HF Nivis project. 
that uses some some techniques from OFDM um, and artificial intelligence to court to kind of find the best path on on HF. Um, so so I have a pile of of things um, to to write up to to summarize and kind of publish. Uh, so so I'll do my best there. So we call it DSG is the shorthand for that or digital spark gap. So if when you when you hear that it's an HF Nivis essentially AI ML project. Um, and you've you might have seen the polynomial signal representation work um, that we're that we're trying to do. So we're we're trying to kind of grapple and get around, get our arms around a a polynomial signal representation, which is a little bit different. So if if you're familiar with sampling theory, what you usually have is is samples in time, voltage samples uh, for your signal. Um, so digital signals, we we take a snapshot at regular intervals of the signal, and then we do all sorts of DSP to that. And in general, what we do is each one of those samples um, gets a sync function, S-I-N-C, and add all those up and you've reconstructed the signal. And we're very comfortable with this technique. There's tons and tons of implementations and understanding and math of it. When you talk about a polynomial signal representation, what you're doing is you're representing each of these voltage samples, each of these, these values, snapshots in time. You're not just representing them with the sync function, you're representing them with a, a polynomial, a, a periodic polynomial. And we're going to dig in and see if we can't get something on the air that demonstrates this and uh, makes this more understandable because there's some claims that are that are pretty bold about the advantages of of kind of progressing to this or, or trying out this particular signal representation. And there's a lot of math. There's plenty of discussions about polynomial and uh, cubic splines and all that, but not a whole lot of implementations over the air. And I think we're kind of a very pragmatic group. We look at if it doesn't work over the air, it doesn't work. And maybe we can contribute towards uh, you know, uh, contribute towards uh, there being uh, some actual examples that people can look at and say, okay, that's demonstrated over the air. That's a, even if it's a relatively simple transmission that you can then show uh, live with actual signals and and uh, a code and math or, or what have you, um, this actually working rather than it being uh, all in math land. All right, questions and comments and reports. Question. Sure. Um, on one of your slides, you mentioned open source licenses and mindset. Could you elaborate a bit? I find the whole subject of the myriad of open source licenses confusing, and sometimes they get in the way uh, rather than help with uh, what I consider to be real open source projects? Yes, that's a really, really good question and deserves uh, uh, many hours of, <laughs> of, in fact, there's there are many, many hours of discussion and presentation about this and there's whole conferences and organizations devoted explicitly towards open source licensing. Because you were talking about designs, we're talking about actual real work done by people with effort. Um, it it's not it shouldn't be surprising at all uh, that we then move towards how do you protect the intellectual property of people that are essentially donating their work to the to what they would consider to be like the public domain or the or the greater good or or you know common cause or whatever. And from a very um, you know, sort of, sort of naive and and maybe basic point of view. It's like, well, just give it away. Uh, who cares what happens to it? And it, very quickly, people find out they really do care what happens to it, and 
and open source licenses are the way to to kind of grapple with this and to kind of ensure that the value and intent of your work um, that's not being done for commercial purposes is honored. And this is why there's a there's a myriad, there's a lot of different open source licenses. In order for it to really be an open source license in general, we we look to the uh, to the open source uh, institute or OSI. Um, or open source initiative, and the OSI people are the ones that um, that have really kind of pioneered the the definition and enforcement of open source licenses. And we're a uh, a member society of OSI, and we sign on to this sort of mindset. So the reason why there's so many different open source licenses is because there's so many different ways to define and use work, and if somebody wants to work on something and they honestly do not care how it's used, they don't they don't mind, they want it to be maximally permissive, uh, then there's a license for that. If there's a desire for it only to be used in a, in a narrow or particular way, then there's a license for that. So if you want maneuverability, then you're going to have to have some, some instability and some flexibility uh, in your system. So there's lots of different licenses. There are only a few that are kind of like the the big ones. Um, there's there's a few licenses that are consistently picked by the community uh, over and over again. So so there's a few licenses that are very popular for for FPGA work in particular, since there there wasn't a whole lot of work here uh, for for a while. Um, the CERN license, the Open Hardware license. Uh, has kind of stepped up, uh, especially the 2.0 version. There was a 1.0 version, lots of feedback about that, but the CERN Open Hardware License version 2.0 is the one that we use as default for firmware and hardware because it's it's really quite good. Um, then there's, the for software licensing, there's, a, there's much more available. So software has a much stronger um, tradition of, of open source. Uh, mindset and practice. So there's there's a bigger variety of licenses there, um, and we use GPL version version 3.0 as a default. What we do at ORI is we say whatever license that you that you and your team want for your project that that meets your needs, uh, you should use that. That we offer the defaults only as like here's a starting point. This is what we think is good, and here's why. Uh, but you get to pick uh, what we really discourage is no license at all because that's not great for anybody and you know you really do have to kind of put put some time into figuring out which one is uh the one to use i guess that the the way that i view it is that because there's um a diversity of licenses that this kind of shows that there is a uh, active and productive debate about the details of how to manage intellectual property, and and it's a good sign in general for for open source work. The downside of this is that you're exactly right; it can be tremendously confusing to figure out which one is uh, the right one for your project. And sometimes you're going to need to talk to to an expert. Um, and thank goodness uh, OSI exists and that they are there and they're extremely helpful and responsive. Um, if that's not good enough, then there are an increasing number of, of lawyers and experts that are out there that can give you really good advice. There's a number of, of firms uh, that like uh, organizations like EFF, uh, another fantastic resource for this uh, that can recommend. And and a lot of those will, will give you advice for a very little amount of money. And, you know, there are licenses like the Tapper license that come from the amateur radio community that have proven useful. So it, the answer to any really good question is it depends. And that's, that's pretty much the answer for which open source license should you use. It kind of depends on, on the, the work itself, what kind of work it is and what the, what the goals of the, the team, the people producing it are. And another huge factor is what particular area that work is in. For example, space and satellite work, that's kind of, that has in the past been tricky and restrictive. We've gotten a lot of regulatory uh, relief because of ORI's work, um, but you still really kind of need to guard your work with some sort of 
license that will uh, allow you to share it uh, easily and well. And so that I hope that answers it a little bit. Um, I, in general, it's it's as confusing as it has to be, and possibly a little bit more confusing than it needs to be. <laughs> you know, there's you. Uh, I think you said said the open source initiative. That's where we look. Yeah, OSI is uh they're great. Uh, there's there's another OSI. There there's Institute versus Initiative. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Open Source Initiative is what I'm is what I mean. Um, okay. here I'll give you a link. No, I I've got the link. I just ran across two of them, and it's uh. Yeah, they're at opensource.org. I'll put it in the chat, and just, that's uh they're the, they're great. Just the simple list that they provide is four or five screens long. That's right. <laughs> it, and, and I'm glad you pointed them out because a new one cropped up on my radar the other day that I didn't know about and now I understand it, the MIT license. Yeah, yeah, MIT license is a big player. Um, GPL license is a, is a big one. Um, Creative Commons, if you're familiar with that, that's a whole whole collection of licenses of different levels. Um, you know, CERN Open and Hardware CERN, License. CERN is three levels. Yes, CERN has three levels. We we recommend the most permissive, um, just to make it uh, uh, as easy as possible for the work to to be reused. Um, but you know, I mean, when you're talking about engineering work and design work, um, artwork, uh, all of these sorts of things that. And and when you want it to be open open source, uh, there's a there's a lot of shades of gray, so it's good that we have the the variety that we have, and it's um it's kind of evidence of the the level of activity and 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 how important open source has become. Um, the flip side of that is exactly as you say, it can be quite daunting to look at this list and and. And like you might be wondering, like if I choose the wrong open source license, is something horrible going to happen to my work or me? You know, am I am I going to look like an idiot for choosing a Creative Commons license, or am I going to prevent somebody from using my work if I choose, um, say for example, GPL 2.0 versus 3.0? And you know, it it does require some some of your time to to figure it out and to figure out what is the right level for you. These are all, this is the most relevant question really mm -hmm. for figuring stuff out. It's, it's, you're not wrong at all. <laughs> um, I'm just confused. So yes. You're, this you're is helping, the... <laughs> you've given me a place to go educate myself and I will do that. Yeah. Oh, OSI, the open source initiative people are amazing. It, we're really happy to be part, you know, to be, a, to be a community member and to get, to get their help and support and advice. Um, it's a, it's the right organization to look look towards for right. for licensing. Your organization says open source, so I figured you'd be the best one to ask. Well, yeah, we'll just but we're not we're not experts in licensing. Uh, we try to be as uh, as responsive and good a, and as possible about about creating open source work. So we rely very heavily on on OSI uh, to. You know, for advice on on licensing and to put into practice what they what they say. So it's a excellent place to go. EFF is another one that's helped us out uh, repeatedly. So the Electronic Frontier Foundation is uh, has a very clear, uh, visceral understanding of of what it means to to put open source work out there, to defend it, and to to increase uh, you know freedoms when when it comes to to design and, and sharing and communicating. So so EFF and Epic is another organization that's that's worth worth looking at. Um, I've had a lot of direct communications and experiences with both EFF and OSI, and it's been been very good and helpful. I don't think we would be where we are today at all without either EFF or OSI helping us. Kind of the goal, I think, is to those of us that organize the work and try to propose and and you know propose either structures, you know, organizational structures or or outreach or or do technical support or do technical work 
the the goal here should is to make it as easy as possible for volunteers to participate. And it's easy to say that, but it's it can be very difficult to pull that off. Like you really have to be committed to making it easy for volunteer, easy and safe for volunteers to participate because there may be weirdo regulatory stuff or um, you know commercial grumpiness. So you, you really do have to kind of like look out for folks and to make it easy for them to participate. Open source licenses are a big part of that, you know, licensing the work. And then, you know, sometimes it can, can come across as, as uh, grumpy and ticky. For example, um, when it comes to the um, Free Software Foundation, for, for instance, uh, this is a venerable long-term player in open source uh, free and open source software, or actually free software, free software foundation. Uh, and if you wanted to be part of the free software foundation, like a GNU project, GNU project, then you had to fill out paperwork. And every time that you, you know, made a major sort of uh, deal with them or or wanted to to set up a project, then then you would have to fill out all this paperwork and and sign over, you know, explicitly sign sign rights and things like that. And over time, um, you know, the, the sort of the 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 impact of this uh, faded. Like it's like, okay, this is this is actually something that people are doing in order to to coalesce together in sort of a union to protect their work, their free work. Uh, and then it became, over time, perceived more and more as a onerous sort of chore. <laughs> And that what are we getting, you know, by signing over all of this, these, uh, doing all this documentation, jumping through this hoops, what what are we getting for this? Um, and so, you know, it's sort of a lesson in it, it over time, we, we take things for, start to take things for granted, that big innovations in uh, things like licensing or, or banding together to kind of protect your work, over time, they can become taken for granted. And over time, organizations that provide these services uh, can get comfortable and and maybe start to to look at at this as more of a way to control things rather than to enable so all of these are sort of organizational lessons that that all of us should pay attention to and should always try try very hard to to serve the members and to make it easy for people to participate All right, any other questions or topics? Or corrections? Paul, you might have some additions and corrections to the to the different project slides. Here we go. Lost my window. Um Nothing, not really. That on the DSP ten project, that's ancient history from Tapper and Amsat. Um, reverse engineering was a, a very small part of it. That was not the main thrust. The the Delanco spry board that we used as a uh, initial prototyping platform was not documented to that level of detail. Uh, but it was so making a schematic of it was a, a, a side project. But programming it and getting it to do prototype things was was possible even without that, and was being done. That the discussion that that never really got out into the public was design debate and discussion about how where to go with DSP and and uh, what platform to target and things like that. Um, it's wrong to say it didn't go anywhere though. Um, there was a product, and it did make it out into commercial manufacture. Uh, it never really took over the world, I don't guess, but uh, uh, stuff did come out of that project, and it was, uh, I think you have to call it a, a modest success. It did not become the next TNC, although that was one of the main topics for discussion back in those days, is whether they wanted to be the next TNC or not. So there's a lot of in really interesting stuff that was going on, and it would have been wonderful if it had been more open, but... In those days, the infrastructure really wasn't there. That the best way we could get uh, real time or near real time collaboration over the internet was to go to CompuServe, 
because uh, there was no internet that was available to most people. You had to be at a company that had a forward-looking policy about the internet, or you had to be at a university. Not everybody was. So a lot of stuff got done in private that might have been done in public uh, today. Yeah, I think we probably underestimate how dramatically different things are <laughs> and have and have been had and have been multiple times. I think we're if you look back to 1988 and look today to 2023, that there's multiple essential multiple revolutions in in the way that we organize work. You know, I, I think we're now kind of dealing with the the aftermath of the walled gardens for for communication and the kind of the rise of or a re-rise, you know, it's a revival of of old school, you know, open open platforms that were uh, at the time an answer to things like CompuServe. I distinctly remember Prodigy and CompuServe because I had to deliver tech support for Apiary Incorporated, who I worked for at the time, uh, over these these services, and and it was um, kind of a a, a revolution uh, for IRC to come along. So I think we've all seen in, like web forums um, kind of get overtaken by, by things like Facebook and groups and groups IO and, and now there, there may be uh, a shift again. So the way that we talk is uh, the way that we communicate really kind of affects the organization, the structure of projects and the structure of projects affects the work. So the work itself is never independent from the social structure. And we have had some significant transformations, especially in amateur radio and in engineering in general. All of this stuff has has some, some pretty big repercussions. So I guess one of our jobs at ORI is to try to figure out what the best way is to, to get the word out and allow people to participate with as little friction as possible. And I got to tell you, it's not an easy uh, thing to keep going. Um, just got to keep trying and and be open to to new ways of doing things. It would be really neat if the all the discussions about the the DSP ten project could could be published. Uh, but I understand that they were they were intended to sort of be private. So kind of dumping them on the internet would be uh, maybe unfair. <laughs> not not the best way to do it. Um, but as a case study of of really innovative and fun work in amateur radio. It just shows that this stuff's been going on for a long time. And, you know, there's, there's lots of things that, that I think we can point to in amateur radio that like, this is a cool project and this is a big innovation, but there's, there's a equal or much larger number of, of projects that, that are, are now unknown or hidden, um, you know, not, not visible, uh, but happened in, in recent living memory. And um, it just, it just goes to show that we're we're a good bet in terms of innovation and and experimentation. So I don't know the uh, plenty plenty to think about. That's uh, and plenty to uh, to tackle. Uh, like over the next week, the just the just the small list of things that we need help with is enough to keep a bunch of people busy for, <laughs> for the entire week. Um, and then we'll, we'll come up here pretty shortly on a, on a week where uh, we have a big show to do. And then later in the summer, another big show, you know, so we'll, we'll shift back and forth from, from outreach and talking with new people and presenting work to trying to get the work done in the first place. And all of that, you know, uh, worked through all of that is is trying to spread the word and, and get more folks involved. Because uh, I think it's fair to say that we have a lot more work than people at any time, really. We've been very, very fortunate to have the response that we've had and the wonderful teams that we have. Um, you know, but you, you have to continually do outreach and welcome new people. You know, turnover in most open source teams is uh, as a particular style, a particular shape. Oftentimes there's a few people that are uh, the dominant contributors and then a very high turnover for the rest. Um, and I, just just as a very biased point of view, I'd like to tilt it more towards 
you know, welcoming people and making making them uh, making it possible for them to stick around for for a while, and and really kind of develop skills and get something out of it. And there there are a lot of other projects out there that do the opposite. That the you know high turnover, they're really very good at publishing a list of things that need to be done, like issues list on GitHub and and getting lots of people excited to come come through and pick one up and solve it and then move on. And and that's fine. There, there's a reason that, that sort of structure exists in the world. It it does it does work for certain projects. And I look at our lineup and I think that that what we're doing is um maybe not as easily divided up. Um that that it does require a little more seat time. The things that we're doing are are maybe more more complicated, sort of longer longer term in terms of time. Um, but that's uh you know just my gut instinct about what we're doing. All right, any updates from the lab? I don't think so. The We've have we changed anything since last week? I don't think so. We've uh, we've got the two systems all set up the way they're supposed to go, and have made some progress on getting them working on with the different software configurations. But uh, been a lot of other things going on this week. Yeah, I think the the new hardware went better, or integrating the new hardware went better than I thought. It still took a lot of time and effort, but. But I'm happy with the new direction and the new new hardware. I think the only toe stubbing that that has happened to me is that the the two radio boards are are names very similar. So there's the nine thousand two and the nine thousand nine, and I've gotten several several times almost gotten confused between the two when documenting or or working with them. Um, so that's 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 been my only complaint and. Um, It'll get better. It'll get better over time. But if 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 I'm having trouble uh, keeping it straight, then that's a that's kind of a red flag to to watch out for 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 people joining up. You know, it's a little bit unusual to have two two different boards in the same level of stage of uh, of integration and development in a lab. Usually, that you know, some components engineer or some engineer tasked with picking the next component is the only one has to worry about that. And then everybody just uses the radio and the board. And here we have multiple things in flight at once. Yeah. And one's it's attached to it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. The name naming them could, could help the, the baseboards are pretty different too. One's a 7,000 series Xilinx and the other is an ultra scale plus. And those are, they're not, not the same. You know they're they're different enough, uh, so so it sort of looks like oh they're they're two different radios on top of essentially the same dev board and that's not exactly right. So it's a uh, it's subtle and if it's if it's difficult for us in any way then it's going to be many times more difficult for a new person. So in terms of documentation, I think we've got a lot to do. We've got um just a, a lot to catch up with on building the um the embedded version of linux uh for for both of the boards for build root like we said last week there's three different ways to to you know to communicate with the there's three different embedded linux versions for these systems at least at least and that these three have each have distinct advantages and disadvantages they're all fairly close in that they all use the same um, reference design from analog devices for the FPGA. But they all are, they all are d done differently and, and uh, from different, essentially ecosystems or different companies with different emphasis and, and different uh, advantages. So it's been, it's been an adventure kind of picking through all the, these three these three offerings, um, and we're having a lot, we're, we're still having trouble building the one from MathWorks. And yeah, it's I, would not, I would not say that what we have is a documentation 
<laughs> no, you don't need to figure out the answers before you worry about writing them down. Yeah. Well, I would say that we can document the the build, especially from MathWorks, up to the point where, where it's totally working for the baseboard. So that is true. We've been able to build the the MathWorks build root version. So if you want to use MATLAB and Simulink with our dev boards, this is supposedly the right answer. This is this will give you some advantages. And those builds existed. They, they finally worked with some patches and some some additional libraries and all. And, and getting that written down is good. Adding in the DTS files for the device tree for the for the radio cards on these dev boards has not uh, been straightforward or easy, and I've been somewhat surprised by that because, you know, Math, MathWorks really wants to enable SDR work and all this digital communications toolboxes and all this stuff and all this activity, and and their their in-house experts are like, Dad, you're far beyond where we can help you. I'm like, that's not great. <laughs> that's not good. <laughs> so I think we've, we've given it a week, you know, and, and all, and we're going to have to go back out and do another round of like, really like figuring it out and publishing it. So where are the lines, like the lines between the radio card and the base and the base dev board, you know, the, the FPGA dev board, that's a, obvious line like analog devices makes the radio card xilinx makes the dev board mathworks claims to address it all but their their build of build, build root works up to the point where you have to start customizing the 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 um the build of linux for the uh for the radio card so if you're not using a 9361 then you know it uh, or a 9371 they actually did a whole lot of work there. It looks like those two targets are the only ones that that they they went all the way with. Um, but they're really excited about the nine thousand series stuff that we have. So I'm I'm hoping that that things will uh, evolve over the next week, and we'll maybe find the find more people or figure out what we're what we need to do if we document the snot out of it, and and then look really hard at like okay what what what's enabled by all of this work like you now can address everything and handle everything and you can put your fpga station in the loop and and do a lot of radio work and make it easy for people um wow things get really exciting very quickly and that you know that's kind of the goal but but right now we're stuck in a particular uh spot we're, we're way way far along in the process but we have to be able to build the device tree the device tree for for Linux has to include the radio on the card stuck on the set forward and and so far it's not it's not working yet. So we we can do this over in Petal Linux. Um I'm really sure. Um so the right answer may be to just pop on over to Petal Linux and build up uh you know an, an OS, an embedded OS that includes the the dev board and and go back to uh trying to code everything in um in vivado uh and also try to see if that if all the benefits from hdl coder and and matlab and simulink still work with a with a pedal linux build they what what we got from what we got from mathworks was no don't do that 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 we have um we have special sauce you know worked into the build root version um but if it's impossible or really really hard to get the device tree working that's a big drawback so so maybe we can contribute you know here's how you get a custom build for the 9009 and the 9002 on these dev boards which are already natively supported in mathworks build root so uh, i'm hoping that we can figure that out and and publish it other people have done this you know you can see evidence of their um, of their work on various web forums and and in questions, uh, but in reaching out to these people, they're very cagey about how they did it. So not a not a great sign, but like you know, <laughs> it means it's possible. And the the recipe is, is a little obscure, and you know, liberating that sort of knowledge is what we're after. So that's that's the status on that.
hopefully by next week we'll be able to report that we have uh, easily addressing the uh, devices in uh, in our stations uh, from from the lab and and remotely that everything is working over the air and uh, and all that. Does, Independent. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Does Petalinux have a licensing issue? A, l a licensing issue. A, a lot of stuff that comes out of Cylinx, you have to pay for if you want to oh, use it. Yeah, Petalinux is free. It's uh, a okay. yeah. It's a uh, it's neat. That's what we were using with the ninety three seventy one when and the um the ZC seven oh six, and you build up a uh, you use Petalinux to 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 and the Petalinux tool chain. It's all free and open source. So no, there isn't any licensing issue. There really isn't a licensing issue with e any one of these. Uh, from analog devices, you can get the Kuiper build from uh, the Kuiper build is their their image. Uh, their version of Linux, and it has IIO, industrial input output, and it uses the, it, you know, it uses their uh, HDL reference design. Um, and we've used it successfully. Uh, Petalinux also uses IIO, industrial input output library. It also uses the analog devices HDL reference design, and Petalinux does not have any licensing issues that I'm aware of at all. Um, and then there's oh, math, they, MathWorks build they, root. They, I just looked it up. They used to have a license issue. Oh, did they? That's interesting. That must be before my it, recent times. It says here the Petalinux tools license is no longer required. Users can install and use Petalinux tools to deploy royalty free OS images. So apparently they changed the deal. Good. So that's good. That's very good. Yeah, that's right on. Yeah, it's, it seems to be pretty straightforward if you, as long as you know all the command line. It's a five or six step process to get Petalinux to build a an image for you. You have to graft in Yocto layers. You have to know where to put the DTS files, which is the device tree stuff. So building in the device tree, you go and you get the device tree source files from analog devices. You're building for the baseboard. And the Petalinux process gets past the problem that we're having with the MATLAB uh, image, uh, which is how do you get the device tree to compile correctly for MathWorks build root for like the 9002 and the 9009 on these supported boards. So Petalinux has been good. The downside to Petalinux is like once you get it built, then, well, uh, HDL Coder looked at it and went, I can't put you in the loop. You can target it uh, for, for HDL coder work, uh, but we weren't able to get it to do uh, live iterations. And then the MathWorks people said, oh yeah, you got to use our build route for it, for that. So that's one of the reasons why we're spending time um, looking at the the MathWorks build route. Um, it, it may be that we, we go back to Petalinux to get this stuff done and we give up using FPGA in the loop as part of our process. Uh, but I'm I'm not yet to the point where I want to give up. Um, you know, because having live FPGA in the loop would would really speed up a lot of the testing and and make the you know demonstrating over the air a lot easier. But yeah, thanks for pointing out there. Used, I, I think I vaguely remember Petalinux being a license. Like you had to, just like a lot of things, like the license might be free for the asking, but you still have to go get it, which is still a hoop that you have to jump through. You know, so I don't remember. I don't remember if you had to pay for Petalinux or not. Um, maybe it says on some of the older sites you found or some of the some of the sources you found. I know things in general have kind of progressed to, towards being more accessible and more open, which is good, uh, you know, especially for tool chains. It's like if you're a company, I think I'm I'm biased in the direction of you need to to guard and and to 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 kind of like keep proprietary the things that that differentiate you as a business, and the rest of it give away. <laughs> and it, it, in the end, it will help you. Oh. I have similar thoughts about Vivado and 
and FPGA tools in general. Okay, any last uh, questions or comments for office hours? Nothing here. Okay, thank you. Yeah, James had to, to take off for school um, and is looking forward to next week. And uh, we'll have lots more updates during the week. There's plenty going on. Uh, thank you everybody for, for coming. And if you're, if you're watching this, thank you very much for watching and you're more than welcome to kind of join the fun. We're Open Research Institute. And if you go to openresearch.institute and click on getting started, then that's the best way to get in touch with us and to get involved in our Slack or mailing list or GitHub accounts and, and meetings like this. All right, everybody, I'll, uh, I'll shut down and I will see you all uh, next week. It'll be exciting. That'll be the last meeting before IMS 2023, the International Microwave Symposium, which is here in San Diego. Uh, so we'll, we'll have a, if all goes well, we'll have a, a live report uh, from IMS uh, uh, about about all of our activities and presentations and all the amazing things going on there. So there will we'll be plenty uh, coming up in June. All right. See you soon.